Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for attending the teach-in on understanding the war in Ukraine. We wanted to start by thanking our sponsors, the Office of the Provost, the Center for Glo Global Engagement, where you are, International Programs, and the College of Communication and Information. Um, also, I think we all here in the room owe a lot of gratitude to the amazing faculty who have committed their time and expertise to make this possible and to help us all understand the context uh, for this conflict. Um, I also wanted to let you know that um, they're doing even more behind the scenes and the Department of Modern Languages is going to be offering a course in elementary Ukrainian starting in the fall. Um, so there's a lot going on at the university and that is something that you might want to know about. Um, I wanted to just uh, briefly um, explain the logistics of what we're doing this evening, but I don't want to take any of their time because we have really esteemed experts here um, assembled. But um, this is really a teach-in, so, so they're going to, for this, for this space of time, not speak to other experts, but speak to those of us who are novices in the field to help us um, get some context for this uh, very complex and often mystifying uh, set of events that is unfolding, and also to help us sort of interpret that torrent of information and misinformation that we're getting moment by moment. Um, and I'm really, really grateful to them for, uh, for helping us with that, for helping us make meaning of things that are difficult to understand. Um, what's going to happen is they're each going to speak for a very few minutes. I'm not even going to introduce them because I don't want to take any of their time. Um, but their bios are on the website. You can uh, link to the website through the QR code that you got if you want to know uh, more about them. And we have very distinguished faculty here, so it's, it's a shame to not introduce them. But again, I'm trying not to use up their time. Um, you can submit questions also using a QR code, and um, they will come to me in a Google Doc uh, because often there are more questions than we have time to answer. I'm gonna, we're going to try to uh, uh, prioritize them by you know, things that come up often, right? And so those questions that many people ask are likelier to be uh, asked here, but I'm sure there will be lots of really interesting questions. Um, also, I want to remind you that, or let you know, that there's a reception afterward. So um, if you have um, a little more time to talk and to uh, think more about these things, there's going to be snacks and coffee and uh, lemonade, I believe, outside. And we all look forward to seeing you then. Um, and uh, with that, thanks very much to you for being here and to our faculty. And I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Jonathan Grant from the History Department. Okay, thank you. Um, at the uh, very heart of the matter is the question of Ukrainian national identity, and especially the question of Russia's recognition of the Ukrainian people as a separate nation and present day borders of Ukraine. At its deepest historical level, the current war in Ukraine flows from Russia's experiences as an empire rather than a nation state. Consequently, Russia has had difficulties with nationalisms of any sort as a threat to imperial integrity. Ukrainian nationalism slash identity is especially vexing for Russia and Russians because they do not recognize it. Even in Tsarist times, there was suppression of Ukrainian national culture, and Ukrainians were called little Russians, signifying that they were still Russians who just kind of folk, spoke kind of funny, uh, but they were not uh, a different people. Uh, more recently, since the breakup of the Soviet Union, Russian policymakers refer to the former Soviet republics, such as Ukraine, which are now independent countries, as the near abroad. And near abroad connotes that these territories are not seen as real foreign countries, but as part of a unique ongoing Russian sphere of influence. So to back up for a thousand plus years of history to get us here. Um, both Russians and Ukrainians look back to the medieval state of Kievan Rus as their predecessor state. Uh, Kiev was the capital city of this state. Um, and this is the state that uh, officially accepted Orthodox Christianity in 988. And the town of Moscow was within Kievan Rus, but Moscow was a latecomer, not an important town, um, and it's not even mentioned until 1147 as a stockade on a, on a frontier. So uh, this was you know, the, the Kiev story, not the Moscow story. 
the Tsardom of Muscovy, which turns into the Russian Empire, comes out of that, uh, and we eventually have czars in Moscow starting in the 1550s. Meanwhile, starting in the 14th century, the western half of the former Kievan Rus state came under the dominance of Lithuania and later the Polish kingdom. The developing differences between Russians and Ukrainians were accentuated by this splitting of the former lands of Kievan Rus. In 1654, the Zaporozhian Cossack host, located in today's eastern Ukraine, uh, had been operating as um, uh, certainly an autonomous power and uh, in its uh, own lights uh, was exercising sovereignty. Uh, but in 1654, that Cossack host uh, accepted the protection of the Muscovite Orthodox Tsar uh, after the Cossacks had been fighting a war against the Polish state for some time. Uh, so that opened the door, and Russian imperial administration gradually absorbed Ukrainian lands, depriving them of autonomy and cultural specificity. The growing Russian Empire also increased its Ukrainian territories in the West during the partitions of Poland under Catherine the Great, uh, the partitions from 1772 to 1796. So Poland disappeared from the map, uh, and uh, uh, Russia got a, a, a big chunk of that. Meanwhile, Western Ukrainians were acknowledged as a distinct nationality by the government of the Austrian Empire. Ukrainians in the Habsburg Empire could develop their own culture and language, including Ukrainian language schools. So the Austro-Hungarian Empire had recognized the Ukrainian people, whereas the Tsarist Empire had not. Both these empires collapsed at the end of World War I, and two self-proclaimed Ukrainian states emerged on the map for the first time the Ukrainian People's Republic, with a capital in Kyiv, and the Western Ukrainian People's Republic in Galicia, with a capital in Lviv. The two states, the two different Ukrainian states, even proclaimed their union, uh, but it did not survive the turmoil of Polish invasion and Russian civil war. Uh, the communists uh, winning the civil war and establishing the Soviet Union uh, incorporated the Eastern Ukrainian lands under their control as the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, uh, which became a founding republic within the Soviet Union. Western Ukrainian lands became part of the Polish state that was resurrected after World War I. And with that, I will, I'm out of time, so I'll stop. I'm gonna start with a little linguistic history. Um, the peoples that we know as the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, and the Russians uh, came as a social unit, uh, tribes that were initially located in the Pripyat marshes, which is essentially the area where Chernobyl is today. Um, they all spoke essentially the same language. Uh, as Jonathan has indicated, uh, Kiev and Rus became very sophisticated as a cultural and economic center uh, in the eighth and ninth centuries. And over the next uh, three or 400 years, uh, some of the people in that area moved to the north and the east, uh, in part because the Mongols had come in and totally sacked Kiev. Uh, somewhere around the 1500s, the dialect of the people in the Northeast was sufficiently different than the dialect spoken in the Kiev area uh, that linguists say that this is the point at which Russian and uh, Ukrainian became distinct languages. But I think it's important historically to realize that Russian developed out of Ukrainian and not the other way around, which is the way most people think. All right, and then I'm gonna jump forward to the 20th century. Uh, the Bolshevik Revolution obviously changed the world. Uh, it was followed by a civil war for about four years, which devastated the area we know as Eastern Ukraine. 
Uh, I don't think Western Ukraine suffered nearly as badly, but obviously it did. Uh, and the Soviet Union coalesced uh, under Lenin and then under Stalin. And Stalin was the most brutal leader uh, in the history of the world that we know of. He makes Hitler look like a piker, quite frankly, given the number of people that were murdered under uh, Stalin's rule. Uh, and most importantly for this discussion, in the early 30s, uh, when Stalin tried successfully to take a very backward rural and agricultural uh, state and turn it into an industrial power, he essentially took all of the grain and all of the cattle in the southern part of his empire, which was Ukraine, to feed the uh, industrial workers in the major cities. And this is known as the Holodomor. Uh, I think my Ukrainian is terrible, but what it means basically is death by famine. And a very good book, a very disturbing book that you might want to read is called Red Famine. It was written by a historian named Ann Applebaum. Uh, it is one of the most disturbing books you will ever read uh, in your lifetime. And whatever happened prior to that uh, in terms of the relationship between Russians and Ukrainians, the Holodomor absolutely and irrevocably changed that relationship. Uh, and the things you may hear or read about the the Russians and the Ukrainians being brothers uh, has a lot to be uh, changed. It has a lot to be uh, modified. I think I will stop at that point. OK, I'm going to pick up in the Soviet period as well, but focus more on the international relations. Um, so NATO was formed as a collective security organization in 1949 with 12 members. As Lord Ismay, the first secretary general, famously quipped, its purpose was to keep the Soviets Union out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. Um, the Soviet Union formed its own collective security organization, the Warsaw Pact, in 1955 after West Germany became a NATO member. The Warsaw Pact originally had eight members. There was no direct military confrontation between the two organizations, and the Warsaw Pact's largest military engagement was its invasion of one of its members, Czechoslovakia, in 1968, which was justified on the grounds that any threat to socialist rule in any state in the Soviet bloc was a threat to them all. In 1989, the communist governments in Eastern Europe began to fall. East Germany withdrew from the pact after German reunification in 1990. The pact was dissolved by its member states, and this is important. It was not the West that dissolved the Warsaw Pact. It was the member states themselves that chose to dissolve it. Um, and they did that in February of 1991. And then in December of 1991, the Soviet Union was dissolved as well. And that, again, was at the decision of the members of the Union, largely led by uh, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. <laughs> so um, then um, Russia did form a collective security organization with six of the former Soviet republics in 1992. Um, Ukraine did not participate in this. NATO had 16 members in 1989 as communism was falling. It has 28 today. So what happened? A number of former Warsaw Pact and post-Soviet states requested to join. So why did they want to join? The first thing was that they no longer had a security guarantor. Um, when they were in the Warsaw Pact, theoretically, the Soviet Union was going to protect them, although actually it used the pact mostly to keep them in line. Um, they also wanted to be part of Europe, and they saw joining um, NATO as part of the path toward EU membership. Um, 
So initially, NATO actually was not really excited about this. <laughs> so how could the collective security guarantee that is the purpose of NATO be expanded to include these states? What could they contribute to the alliance? U.S. officials were divided, but eventually they did push for expansion. NATO agreed upon criteria for membership, and they created an admissions process, which was not easy. It was a fairly long process for a lot of countries. Um, during this early period, Russia also increased its cooperation with NATO, both civilian and military. However, the NATO bombing campaign in Kosovo in 1999, the Russian actions in Georgia in 2008, and the intervention in Ukraine in April of 2014 led to a halt in this cooperation. Russia was opposed to NATO expansion, particularly to the former Soviet republics of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. They argued that these states were in their sphere of influence and defined NATO expansion as a threat to their own security. It is important to remember that the Soviet Union, picking up on Jonathan's point, was the last remaining multinational empire. History teaches us that the collapse of empires is accompanied by bloody efforts to hold on to their former territories. The problem is that the people in many of these territories no longer want to be part of Russia's empire, and they have been willing to do what it takes, including military resistance in Ukraine's case, to guarantee this. Rather than scaling back its aims in response to this resistance, Russia has doubled down. The Chechen wars, the conflict in Georgia, the conflict in Ukraine, and threats against other states such as Sweden, Finland, and Poland. The result is that Sweden and Finland are expected to join NATO by the summer, and the EU is speeding up membership applications for Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine, three former Soviet republics. Thanks so much. Uh, can you folks hear me if I speak with the mask on? Yes. It's okay? Oh, thank you. All right, well, I'm, it, I'm going to sort of jump off um, from some of Mike Launer's comments, um, but we'll begin um, a little bit further back in the past uh, with a parent language, or more correctly, group of dialects from which all Slavic languages arose, uh, that is from Czech to Ukrainian, from Russian to Bulgarian, uh, is known as Common Slavic. Uh, and common Slavic distinguishes itself from its sisters fairly late in about the 4th century CE. Slavic, in turn, belongs to the Eastern, or so-called Satem, branch of the Indo-European family of languages. Uh, it is thus most closely related to languages like the Baltic languages, uh, and likewise those of the Indo-Iranian family, such as Bengali, Hindi, Punjabi, Urdu, and Persian. English, descending from Germanic, belongs to the Western or Kentum branch of Indo-European. That Ukrainian and English are distant cousins can be seen most closely in kinship terms, which are among the most archaic terms of a language. So for example, uh, in Ukrainian, mate, mother, sestra, sister, brat, brother, synok, son, donka, daughter. We can hear the connections. Recent scholarship suggests that the Indo-Europeans began their conquest of Eurasia, or as some would like to say these days, their migrations across Eurasia, uh, in the fifth or fourth millennium BCE from the southern Ukrainian and Russian steppes. That is to say, this is in fact, the, the, our best recent evidence is that this is where the Indo-Europeans originated. And Slavic itself is usually held to originate in the lands of northern Ukraine and southern Belarus. This is simply to underline the fact that the Ukrainian language is quite autochthonous. Yeah. Um, another point. Uh, that uh, uh, ought to be emphasized, that Ukrainian is not a dialect of Russian, and likewise Russian is not a dialect of Ukrainian. No historical dialect continuum, indeed, exists between the two languages. Um, in its discontinuity from otherwise closely related Russian, Ukrainian is uh, what uh, Heinz Kloss calls a typical Abstand, or distance language. What this means is it is a cluster of varieties of speech distinctly separate from other surrounding languages. Uh, in this way, the relationship between Ukrainian and Russian is not analogous to that between, say, Croatian and Serbian, which were planned as a single polycentric language, 
but have been growing apart since the wars of the 1990s, or Macedonian and Bulgarian, which are what Klaus calls typical Ausbau, or development languages, that is to say, they develop separately from a single dialect continuum. Again, Ukrainian and Russian are different from these relationships. Uh, the languages are not mutually comprehensible to a speaker of one who did not grow up with a certain amount of exposure to the other. Often one will hear Russians claiming that they can understand Ukrainian. In this case, they are usually referring to what is called surzhik, a modern code mixing of Ukrainian and Russian used mostly by urban Ukrainians, especially in the country's east. The history of the Russian language in Ukraine begins fairly late, in the early 18th century, after the Battle of Poltava of 1709 and the defeat of Charles XII of Sweden and his ally, the Ukrainian hetman or warlord Ivan Mazepa, by the Russian Tsar Peter I. Um, as uh, we have learned, at this time the Ukrainian Cossack hetmanate, um, which had uh, signed uh, what its leaders considered an alliance of convenience, uh, with the Orthodox co-religious in Russia, and of course the Russian czars had a very different uh, idea of what this, this uh, contract meant. In any case, um, after the Battle of Poltava, the Hetmanate, which had been autonomous in the Russian Empire, begins to be russified out of fear of further treason. Uh, official documents now had to be composed in Russian, replacing the old, early modern Ukrainian, which was known as Prostaya Mova. Uh, likewise, the term Mazepist began to be introduced for those who showed an excessive interest in things Ukrainian. Uh, the writer Gogol, um, who, as you may know, was a Ukrainian, uh, was often accused of uh, Mazepism. Uh, today's uh, counterpart uh, would be a Banderist. I'm not sure if anyone will be discussing this term. How are we doing? One minute. Okay, well, we'll finish a bit early. Um, further russification was prompted by the reforms of Catherine II, who in 1764 dissolved the Hetmanate into its Russian provinces, uh, also introducing the Russian form of serfdom into Ukraine, uh, which was closely akin to US chattel slavery. Um, and at the same time, the adoption, about the same time, of pseudo-classicism in imperial Russian literature, which allowed only unserious genres, such as burlesques, to be written in the local vernaculars. Over these years, Ukrainian became near dialectized, to use Heinz Kloss's terms, and Ukraine uh, was reduced to a sleepy province of Russia, and again, Ukraine to a so-called dialect. Um, there were a number, I'm out of time, I suppose, um, uh, with all, all of that, uh, that beeping. Uh, but in any case, I should simply point out that um, with the romantic movement of the 19th century, there was an increased interest in Ukrainian and things Ukrainian, as one expects, uh, this interest in local languages and oral tradition. And in response, official Russian government attempts were made to to assimilate cultural elites and suppress Ukrainian cultural production. So over um, the years 1863 and 1876, uh, all publication in Ukrainian, in the Ukrainian language was banned, public lectures, plays, and song performances were likewise forbidden alongside um, Ukrainian books. And the situation only changed after the revolution of 1905 in the Russian Empire. Thanks. Okay. Well, I guess I'll pick off from there. Thank you, Robert. Um, I will speak about contemporary um, Ukrainian language policies and um, the original interest of this topic was actually raised from um, two things. First of all, I was interested in um, legal policies or policies in the media, language policies in the media. And um, the other kind of ground was that I was raised in, in Ukraine. I'm a Russian speaking Ukrainian who spent 17 years in the Crimea speaking you know, only Russian, then went to college in Donbass and taught in Donbass, all in Russian, and then moved to Western Ukraine and lived there for about 14 years, working as a translator and interpreter, again in Russian. So no problem speaking Russian whatsoever, neither at work or at home. And I want to um, go from there and uh, speak about a very interesting phenomenon in um, Ukraine, which is called um, non-reciprocal bilingualism, or another term you may hear, the Kiev Compromise, more often in the you know, English-speaking media or literature. And what it means, it means that two people, two Ukrainians, can speak one to one another. One would be speaking Russian, and the other one would be speaking Ukrainian, and they will be, understand each, will be understanding each other perfectly well, although these two languages are very distinct, as you could hear from Dr. Lohner and Dr. Romanchuk's presentations. Um, and Again, I can say that, I can attest to that. Also, um, for my friends who 
Russian speakers grew up in Russia and would not understand Ukrainian. My family members who are foreigners, for example, they learn Russian uh, as a second language. They do not understand Ukrainian. But Ukrainians, um, Russian speakers and Ukrainian speakers would not understand each other because of that bilingual environment they grew up with and exposure to Ukrainian language. Um, well, what, another point that I want to make uh, is that uh, contemporary language policies in Ukraine have nothing unique in its nature. Although they were used as a, as a pretext for the Russian Federation to invade Ukraine in 2014 and um, the, most, the ongoing war in Ukraine, well, actually, um, language planning and language politics is an important part of the um, nation state statehood or organization, uh, which is based on the idea that um, nation, every nation or a state based on a nation have their unique history, um, they have their um, unique culture and unique language. And you can see it in um, multiple nation states around the world where they um, a national, official national language was established and was standardized in many ways and was used in court, was used in education, was used in media, was used in um, government sphere. So the same thing was uh, going on in Ukraine and actually the first uh, law that established Ukrainian as an official language was adopted in 1989 when Ukraine was still was a part of the Soviet Union. So no objections to that at that time. Uh, well, in fact, Russian, the Russian Federation in 2005 adopted a law on the state language, which very much um, mirrors uh, the language law in Ukraine was adopted uh, later in 2018. So the, the, because of that bilingualism and because people in Ukraine don't really see the status of Russian as a um, critical problem. Actually, in 2016, there was a survey conducted that showed that only 2.4 um, residents of Ukraine saw the status of Russian as their primary concern, whereas 64% thought that the war in the east of Ukraine was their primary concern. Um, so what, um, okay, it, the language question and planning in Ukraine was uh, very much politicized and used by politicians, but to ordinary citizens, there were not so much of the concern. Uh, although they became, language became a primary um, issue for discussion and for lawmaking after 2014, where the um, Ukrainian national identity uh, became really critical. And a number of, number of laws were adopted, including, including language quotas on the media, regulating how much Ukrainians should be used. And again, nothing new here. Um, Canada started language quotas policy in 1971, France in 1996, Poland, early 2000, the Baltic states using language quotas. And I want to just finish, if you have more questions, I'm ready to talk about them, but I want to finish with a simple example from the current U Ukrainian reality. If you turn on a TV, uh, only anchors and hosts are required to speak Ukrainian. So guests to the studio, experts to the studio can speak Russian. So you would see about 50% of the content on Ukrainian TV is to be spoken in Russian because of that, the guests and you know, experts. Films will be shown in Russian with Ukrainian subtitles. So any claim that you know, Russian is threatened in any shape or form in Ukrainian, I think is not substantiated. Right. Um, so I'd like to address the disinformation being used to essentially create a digital front for this war. Um, so to get started, we'll define disinformation as false information deliberately spread to deceive and mislead. Um, so we're seeing disinformation campaigns being waged um, online primarily to craft and maintain false narratives as to why Russia invaded Ukraine, um, as well as to what's actually happening on the ground. You might see specific false claims being made, but I think increasingly the focus of these campaigns is going to be to sow general doubt um, about the veracity of evidence-based information, um, right, by framing this, in fact, as, as fake news. So we're really talking about creating an environment where people are confused and they feel helpless and they feel like they can't trust anything they come across, right, so preying on a lot of our suspicions. Um, where or who is this disinformation coming from? Uh, aside from the Russian state media and increasingly officials, um, we're seeing a lot of pro-Russian groups and individuals, um, some explicitly linked to the Kremlin, coordinating networks of fabricated social media accounts 
These actors are also hacking pre-existing social media accounts because they already have a, a built-in wrapped audience, right, um, to kind of speed up the spread of disinformation. I, I think we'll continue to see more of that. And this is, of course, um, sadly, in addition to individual trolls um, and people who, unfortunately, may believe these claims to be uh, true, right? The disinformation tactics we're seeing being used, you'll see false flag claims, that's pretty par for the course. Um, fact, uh, fake fact checking, which is a little bit more advanced technique we're seeing, and also repurposing of old or irrelevant uh, media in particular to support false claims. So I, th I think to take a step back, it might seem really mind boggling to some of us that, that people believe these false claims. Um, and we wanna be sure that we aren't giving too much airtime to some of these outright lies, I understand that, but I think to dismiss this disinformation as completely unbelievable and not actively fight against it is, is also a mistake, right? So it's really important to know kind of um, how social media platforms operate um, and basic psychology to understand why disinformation and misinformation more generally can be so effective so we can kind of better prevent it and combat it, right? So social media platforms, they primarily profit via advertising. This is all contingent, right, on optimizing the reach of content and encouraging high levels of user engagement. So the algorithms driving these platforms, um, they're weighted heavily for quantity, for popularity, for relevance. They're not necessarily weighted for quality of information, accuracy, um, or anything like that. And the content that we see that widely circulates, that gets a lot of attention, is highly emotional in nature a lot of the times. And that's where disinformation really th thrives, right? Um, on kind of generating a highly emotional reaction in people. So these algorithms, um, they are also in part based on our personal behavior and our data, including what we've previously searched for, who we're friends with, um, right? Things like that, who we already follow. So there is some predictive pre-filtering going on here um, as to like what you're seeing. You might only see things that these algorithms have deemed you to be likely to agree with, um, if that makes sense, right? And in this way, social media platforms can really kind of shrink and hyper curate our realities essentially um, and enable a lot of confirmation bias. So I think this can all kind of explain why uh, this conspiracy theory about the US funded bioweapons lab, as outlandish as it might seem to some of us, right, it was able to kind of gain a lot of traction with certain groups in the United States because it taps into their fears. Um, it tracks with their belief that the current US administration is lying to them, and it's also in line with conspiracy theories that they may already have engaged with and believe, right? So that's kind of how we are where we are. Um, and also, people use a lot of mental shortcuts um, to kind of quickly sort through the loads of information that we see day to day in our digital environments. Um, this doesn't always lead to effective judgment making and decision making, right? Um, and it leaves out a lot of critical thinking. So that's what we really need to be doing um, as you're kind of sorting through all this information online is exercise and promote critical thinking to identify this disinformation first and foremost. Um, and you have simple tools and tactics that you can use. Investigate the source, right? Um, what's their posting history, right? What can you tell about them from their profile? Can you verify that they are who they say they are? Why would they be sharing this information? What is their agenda? Some social media platforms are giving us nudges to say, hey, you know, this is uh, Russian state affiliated, be aware. Um, but other times they're, they're not. Um, TikTok, for instance, is like not up to snuff, y'all. Um, which is very real. Um, but is there evidence to support the claim? Honestly, what does the quick Google search tell you about that person um, and whether there's consensus regarding it? I see I'm out of time, I'm almost done. Um, and then this is really important. Um, please, please try to understand the original context of any media and claims that you are coming across, right? If there is an image or a video something as simple as a reverse image search, right? To see where that media is originally coming from and where it started circulating. Um, and using Google Maps to verify locations of right, uh, these images and things like that. And really what it comes down to though, I know we can't all do deep dives on like everything that we see that seems suspicious, but it comes down to building a network of trustworthy sources, which I'm sure hopefully Patrick can talk about, because I'm out of time. The, the important point that was raised here is a, a bit of about the relationship between emotional and rational reaction to a, a coverage. I think 
it's very easy for a, a situation like the Ukraine to react emotionally. And what we need to do as citizens involved directly or not so directly is to understand our own biases first, uh, because potentially, depending on the news sources you are currently consuming, then that leads you down a path that is potentially deviating from actual facts. And um, my encouragement first and foremost is to at least have two perspectives. So if, for instance, your main news source is uh, Fox News or CNN, to uh, take our two best friends here, you need to have a second source, potentially, that will not be from the same media. So move away from television news and take print or radio. And in fact, I would strongly recommend media that have currently been able to have correspondent on the field. So National Public Radio, for instance, as people who are reporting from Kiev, from other cities in the Ukraine, and the role of those correspondents, if they do their job properly, and people for National Public Radio do, they will depict a situation. If some of you in the audience are a fan of Ernest Hemingway, who is not necessarily known for his journalism skills, but more as an author, but he was a, a journalist uh, during the Spanish conflict, he explains very briefly in many of his interviews that you need to be the eyes of the audience when you go somewhere. And so your role as an audience member is to find sources that depict what's happening without injecting an opinion. A lot of people these days want and feel empowered by giving their opinion. It's particularly true in the US media because this is the style of uh, particularly the television networks in the US to have pundits who believe that they are entitled to an opinion that makes them all of a sudden uh, winning the Pulitzer Prize or uh, having uh, air time and, and, and quality time. You need to move away from that and really understand that the sources you need to seek are sources that are based on facts, facts coming from observation, observation that comes from the ground. As a former journalist, I can tell you that when I covered September 11, for instance, the observation were not coming from my opinion, but from what I was seeing. If I were to inject my opinion, that was ethically wrong. So you need to identify news sources that will provide that, and that's media literacy. The other thing is that you have to worry about the framing of the information. The conflict in Ukraine can be framed in multiple ways. And some people have gone with a very politicized perspective in relationship to the last time we heard about Ukraine, which was in the relationship between Trump and Biden. And so you have an association of Ukraine with Biden's son, which is interesting to a certain extent, but has nothing to do potentially with what's happening today. So you need to go back to historical facts, language, diplomacy, and understand that this region of the world demands an explication and explanation that are taking in, in, in comprehension all those components. It's not just a media issue, it's an issue that demands general knowledge. So my recommendation again is concentrate on news sources that provide multiple perspectives. If you can have the BBC, great. If you read uh, French or Spanish, take El Pais, take Le Monde, take uh, the Guardian, take Der Spiegel, if you like German, R reputed sources that are known for having uh, on-the-ground coverage. And then, again, be aware of your own biases when you come into uh, understanding those facts. But don't precipitate emotionally towards a, a media that has a headline that is attractive. Understand that you're we are in a period of time when the media is not trusted, the media is seen as negative, and we need to be very careful in how we move towards that because again, that will emotionally affect our view of the coverage. And we don't want an emotional reaction to a conflict that demands a rational thinking and attentive thinking to history, language, 
and diplomacy. Thank you very much. I think we're fairly encouraged to see the reaction and the welcome response to the four plus million refugees that have crossed the border from Ukraine to Poland, the Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia as well. But in 2020, uh, the UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner of Refugees recorded 20.7 million refugees, 4.1 asylum seekers, all registered with the UN, 86% um, of them uh, reside or hosted in countries in the global south. So most of the time, we're not, um, uh, we're, we don't experience, we don't see their uh, plight, we don't see their challenges that they're facing. 5.7 million of them are from Syria, 4, point, uh, 4 million of them are from Venezuela, 2.6 million from Afghanistan, 2.2 from South Sudan, and about 1 million from Myanmar. Um, and again, since um, these refugees are in the global south, we don't pay attention until they start knocking at the gates of the global north if it's here in the United States. And in our case, uh, because of Ukraine, uh, uh, Europe. And I would want to pay attention that in the case of Poland, in the case of Slovakia, in the case of the Czech, Czech Republic, there was literally a hostile response to these refugees coming from the global south, where all three countries... Um, utterly uh, rejected the EU quota to accept refugees from these countries. Um, Slovakia, for example, has stipulated that they will only receive Syrian Christians, uh, from, for example, from the Syrian civil war. And <clears throat> again, we recognize that there are the uh, uh, forefront right now kind of countries that are receiving all the currently the refugees that are coming from Ukraine. But I think it's difficult to ignore uh, the approach that they have utilized towards non-European refugees. Uh, the double standard actually doesn't apply just for Central uh, Europe or Eastern European countries. Uh, for example, in the UK, uh, the UK in the last six weeks, six weeks gave 25,000 visas, uh, uh, temporary visas for Ukrainians, which is a fairly low number, I would say, but still encouraging. Um, it's a bit more than what the UK offered uh, Syrian refugees in the last six years. And it's double the amount that the UK has offered for Iraqi and Afghanis refugees since 2003. Um, and lastly, I want us to remember in this context that since 2014, the UNHCR uh, documented about 20,000 people, refugees that have died on their way um, to Europe, um, either drowned in the Mediterranean or uh, have gone missing. Um, and again, this data is found on the UNHCR uh, website. I do want to recognize that this is not just about um, anti-Muslim or about xenophobia. There are other reasons of why we're seeing the warm welcome of Ukrainian refugees. But I would like the audience to put themselves in the shoes of Syrian or Afghan refugees looking or uh, uh, observing what, how Ukrainians are welcomed and them themselves facing fairly exclusionary asylum policies. And I will take this opportunity to call for action and remind everybody that we are actually, Tallahassee is a refugee accepting city so or town. And uh, we have the International Rescue Committee uh, since 2015 settling refugees in Tallahassee. They have at this point 650 clients um, from El Salvador, Syria, Afghanistan, the Congo, uh, and potentially also uh, from Ukraine once they start to stream them into the United States and they help them with employment, they provide them with housing, with basic social services, and of course, physical and monetary donations. So if you wanna do something to help refugees uh, here in small Tallahassee, uh, reach out, just Google IRC Tallahassee, they'll be very happy to accept your donations. I have one minute to address the other topic I was brought here to talk about, and this is the current discussion that takes place in the media about what should we call the crimes that we're observing? In um, Ukraine, is it war crimes? Is it crime against humanities? Is it genocide? We clearly don't have the time to define those right now. Um, I know that uh, President Zelensky used the genocide label to describe what the Russians are doing. Um, and some even prominent scholars here in the United States have also used the label uh, genocide for what is going on in Ukraine. I'll be a bit more cautious and say we, maybe we should not use the label genocide just yet. I think the more evidence that are surfacing um, it does indicate that at the very least we have war crimes and to some extent we're starting to see a systemic use of these crimes, which means that 
crimes against humanity are taking place in Ukraine. Um, but, and, and, and that's the, 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 that's the tragedy. Um, and there's this expectation here in the West that the International Criminal Court and other uh, uh, institutions will hold soldiers and officers and potentially political leaders accountable. I just want to remind everybody that the wills of the international justice are particularly slow. Uh, it took about 20 years to bring some of the perpetrators of the horrific crimes in Yugoslav wars to justice. Um, so I doubt that they will deter any immediate atrocities from taking place. But with the hope, the burden is on us to bear witness and to try to prevent further atrocities from taking place. I tried. <laughs> thank you all so much. Um, and thank you for the amazing feat of staying in time. We were cruel to you by um, compressing your great expertise into this tiny space. But that means that we have lots of time for questions. And there are a, are a really great list of interesting questions here. Um, it is hard for me to figure out which to ask first. But uh, one that came in very early um, and uh, that seems to have been asked uh, a few times, um, maybe a tough one, and uh, several of you might want to take a, a stab at it, but um, some of our audience would like to know, what, are the, what do we think are the real goals for the Russian invasion of, the Ukraine, of Ukraine? Well, I, I have an opinion, which is a minority opinion, I think. Um, for 20 years, uh, and even, even before the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, ultra-nationalists in the, in the Soviet Union and then in Russia have been particularly uh, concerned with the fact that the Slavic population inside Russia is declining rapidly and that in the next 20 or 30 years, uh, Slavs will be a minority in that country. And Putin has been particularly insistent on what he calls Ruski Mir, which is the Russian world, which he envisions as anybody anywhere in the world who speaks Russian and likes Russian culture. Uh, on a more practical level, he is doing everything he can uh, to increase the percentage of citizens in Russia who are Slavic. Uh, Belarus has nine million people who are all Slavic, and he has now uh, created what they call the unity state, which is just, just this side of uh, annexation. Uh, in Ukraine, there are 40 million people, 38 million of them are Slavic. Uh, he would be very happy to have all of them back within uh, uh, his sphere, uh, whether, whether it is within Russia per se or uh, within his influence. If you have noticed the, the news recently, both out of Donbass and out of Mariupol, people are being taken out of those areas and forcibly moved to Siberia. Uh, their Ukrainian passports are being taken away. Uh, and they, in all likelihood, although there are ways to counteract that, uh, in all likelihood, the vast majority of those people are going to become Russians. Uh, in the Donbass two years ago, when it was simply a breakaway uh, province or two breakaway provinces uh, in Ukraine, those people were allowed to vote for the Duma. And in fact, representatives from the D uh, DPR and the LPR were elected to the Duma in Moscow. This is not accidental. If I could just say um, <clears throat> just a couple of words. Uh, if you've been paying attention to what has been coming out of uh, Putin's office over the past um, couple of months, in fact, going back um, to uh, late last year with Putin's famous essay about the unity of the Ukraine and the Russian peoples, uh, what you'll see is that the, um, the motivation for aggression and the apparent goal seems to be changing constantly. Um, all I would say is that this brings to mind um, Freud's famous example of the broken tea kettle. Uh, if you know this example, it's when you loan your neighbor a tea kettle and they return it, it's broken. And uh, they tell you, um, it was broken when I got it. I never borrowed a tea kettle from you in the first place. This, again, this, this uh, inconsistent logic um, 
all, all that it points to, well, on the one hand, it obviously points to the, the fact that they borrowed a tea kettle and broke it. Um, and I think we, th th we have something similar uh, going on, uh, at least in the discourse around Ukraine. But again, what, what all of these inconsistent and self-contradictory messages show um, is that, uh, at least at the moment, the Russian government cannot tolerate an independent Ukraine, in particular, an independent Ukraine um, that uh, it imagines, whether because of linguistic policies, European integration policies, uh, is hostile. Um, in other words, the um, uh, indeed, I, I, I likewise uh, am not comfortable using the term genocide, but a number of editorials that have come out of the official Russian news agency, Uri Novosti, uh, and likewise the most recent statements by um, uh, Medvedev, the Prime Minister and others um, do suggest, uh, 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 at, at the very least, a cultural eliminationist policy, but the more aggressive statements suggest a physical eliminationist policy as well. So that is to say, the G word might be just around the corner. Um, the other thing that you could point to is that Russia has been very fearful of liberal democracy developing in the former Soviet states. Um, they had to accept it in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, but they could kind of push that away because those had been independent between the two world wars. But when it begins to creep into states that are more part of the Ruski Mir, um, that becomes a personal threat to Vladimir Putin. Because if people in Ukraine can have liberal democracy, why can't Russians? Whatever you know, reason they cite, it is not the language. Because the people who are dying right now in Mariupol, the people in, the, in Lugansk and Donetsk are all Russian speakers. That's the Russian-speaking population of Ukraine. And well, actually, Volodymyr Zelensky recently said that um, Putin has done the most for de-Russification of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And whereas if you go back to 2014, um, one of the reasons, well, actually, um, Churkin, who was a representative in the UN for Russia, he said that um, Russia will take you know, actions against Ukraine because, of the, uh, because Russians are now banned from speaking Russian. We don't hear these um, claims now. And I think what, what Dr. Romanchuk said, the RIA Novosti made it very, very clear that you know, it's not the language, it's not the culture, it's just you know, killing Ukrainians for um, following that course of democracy and not wanting to become a part of the Russian world. Thank you. I think if I get, uh, oh, I'll, sure. I'll throw in a, uh, uh, this is the, the historian of me coming in, but um, to me it looks, uh, I mean, the, one of the, uh, I think that domestic policy concerns in Russia are driving this and I, it, uh, uh, I was just happened to be you know, talking, uh, teaching the uh, the Russo-Japanese War uh, in my class a couple of weeks ago, and um, you know the motivation there was um, you, know, you know Russia's looking around what it thinks is going to be uh, an easy win to sort of shore up its uh, uh, domestic uh, strength and make it look like you know the government's strong. Uh, in, in the case of Tsarist Russia, uh, autocracy can still deliver the goods. You know this is what has made Russia great, and we're still a great power, and we can still do this. Uh, and the war went very badly. Um, and I think that uh, you know the, the domestic agenda. I think that uh, uh, Putin wanted to show that he's still in charge, that Russia is a great power, uh, that it has to be taken uh, uh, seriously. And in, in that sense, I see um, Putin more as uh, um, uh, Tsar Putin uh, than uh, uh, Communist Putin in terms of uh, what, uh, what, what the way he looks at these territories as uh, more in the imperial, the old imperial light. And to be fair, just that's not my position, but just to present the different arguments that are out there, uh, Mearsheimer, a famous uh, realist from international politics, makes the argument that it's the West fault. Literally, I'm quoting a uh, title of an article from Foreign Affairs in 2014, that the NATO expansion uh, dr is, is driving uh, this uh, behavior, whether it's in the Crimea uh, uh, and then now with the invasion of Ukraine as well. 
I would say, even in light of, of this argument, even if there's some truth to it, it defeated its purpose, especially in light of the fact that Finland and Sweden now are seriously considering applying to join the NATO and that they even have a longer border with Russia, which means to put NATO right across uh, uh, the back door of, of Russia. Um, if I can interject here. Um, there is no question that there are forces in the West, uh, particularly the neocons, who are very aggressive towards uh, Russia and are willing to do anything possible uh, to constrain Russia. But the notion of NATO expansion as uh, aggression and as a source of a difficulty for Russia simply ignores one fact. In 1991, when the Soviet Union broke up, all of the Warsaw Pact countries understood exactly where they were, and they understood that sooner or later, Russia was going to be strong again, and they all chose to align themselves with NATO. NATO happens to have an open door policy. If you meet these very strict requirements and you want as a nation to become a member of NATO, all you have to do is apply. They all did. We went from 12 nations in NATO to 16 nations in NATO to 28 nations in NATO. That was not NATO expansion. That was all of Eastern Europe running from Russia. If I could also just really quickly point out, um, Mearsheimer is getting really weird lately. Um, I don't know if, um, <laughs> I agree. If, if, if you folks have seen his comments on Butcher, but he seems to be, um, yeah, he, se he seems to be approaching a, a kind of um, atrocity denial um, of, of the sort that we saw in Syria and, and elsewhere, again, yeah. among a certain, uh, a certain political scientists, and I, I would just be very cautious with Mearsheimer today. No, that's not my only point. I just wanted to be fair in presenting all the points that are out there. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. This was really interesting. Um, our next uh, question asks you to comment on um, the Western media's coverage of the crisis and the war. <laughs> I mean, it's difficult to to answer that question because we would have to define Western media and and that encompass so many countries. So I think we'd have to be very careful in, in how we answer that. If the question is how is the US media covering that, then that's also difficult to answer, but a, a bit better. I think again, we go back to media framing and how each news organization decides to impose a narrative onto the issue. And we found that some people have quickly moved to a narrative that was economic. So in terms of the economic sanction, the economic impact, because people uh, on this side of the Atlantic saw, for instance, the price at the gas pump increase. And so therefore, the media understood that they needed to put that frame into their explications. Some people in the media decided to have a frame that was more diplomatic, uh, that demands a, a higher level of knowledge from their audience, so we don't see that too much uh, at the moment, particularly for the general news organization. I think more specialized news organization uh, will, Im will adopt that as well as a historical connection. But I think the, I, I would go back to the, the danger of the media coverage, what, and, and that ties it back a little bit to the, the reasons why I think Putin decided to, to move when he did. Today, in the Western world, the media is not trusted, democracies are not trusted, and there is a, a, a very significant rise of anti-nationalist mm -hmm. movements Mm -hmm. anti-democratic movements and, and and so to a certain extent the, the media coverage is important depending on the news source that you you're following but you have to understand again what news source you're using and, and I want to emphasize that to 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 the point of repeating myself a little bit but because that coverage will vary depending on that news source and if I read the New York Times, 
every morning, and then that's great. And that's going to be one type of news coverage that will differ from another news source, uh, potentially, that has a different bias to, towards the, the information. So uh, that question is, is uh, expected, uh, and people are curious about it, but it, it demands a little bit of a fine-grained analysis, and uh, we have not had a content analysis yet of the coverage. Mm. Uh, to which extent it's uh, neutral, positive, uh, negative. I think if, if we go with the, the valence, it's most likely uh, negative towards that act of invasion. The, the wording is, is mm -hmm. key. But um, I think, again, we would need to, 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 to avoid to jump to conclusions too quickly here because it's an ongoing process. The information trickles as it happens. And uh, war coverage, is difficult for journalists to war on the ground. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we live in a, in a world where we want immediate coverage, immediate answers, and that's very dangerous because journalists understand that um, they, there is potential fame. As a journalist, you're happy when there's a war. <laughs> it's sad to say that's just the reality because potentially that's the highest exposure for your work. But the danger is if you go too quickly you take a chance of not having the right facts, the right information. And so again, we need to take the time to understand what we read, what we see, what we hear, potentially trust radio and print more so than TV, and then be a bit more cautious about jumping to conclusions. War coverage, again, is, is a very difficult aspect of journalism, and, and that demands a lot of attention. So. I'm not answering completely the question, <laughs> but uh, providing a few tools, hopefully, that is helpful. Um, yeah, and I really, I think balance is the key. So uh, again, when you're, you can't wait for information to come to you. Like, to, to get a balanced perspective, um, I really do think that you need to kind of have these sources that you go to reliably, and again, balancing them, having a few. Um, so we've mentioned the New York Times, um, BBC, NPR, I really like their coverage of it, but something like the Associated Press, Bellingcat, Reuters, these are great fact-checking tools um, that, that employ a lot of kind of open source um, reporting, and I, I think that's really useful. I can maybe speak to um, how media has responded to a lot of the disinformation. I actually think they've They've done quite a good job. Um, they've been very forthcoming about what is happening, and disinformation really, really, really thrives when there are gaps um, and lulls in fact-based reporting. Um, so we need to kind of keep up this coverage, and I, and I think that's where we have a role to play, um, is to continually engage with and amplify trustworthy sources online, right? Um, because it's those gaps where where we don't know what's going on, where, where things kind of really um, get out of hand. So I'm not sure if that was helpful, but that's what I'm gonna say. <laughs> Might I quickly add that there are some excellent, and this is something that, that I, I hate to say it, but being um, of, of uh, uh, Ukrainian origin myself, uh, I feel it probably Svetlana does at times as well. Um, that sometimes uh, Ukrainian voices are left out of these sorts of discussions. There's some excellent Ukrainian media in English. In particular, I would recommend Horomadska, um, which is the equivalent of, of NPR, I suppose. Uh, and they're, they're really very good, uh, superb reporting, very balanced. Um, there are some sources that are, that are much more uh, sort of going for the quick, the quick headline. Nexta, for example, you should sometimes read with a grain of salt. Uh, it's, a, it, it's big on, on um, uh, Telegram, I suppose. But no, Hromatska is excellent. There are some other excellent sources. In fact, perhaps we could get some Ukrainian uh, trustworthy Ukrainian media in English onto our, our website as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, read, I read Gramatsky in, in Ukrainian, mm -hmm. and I've been following them for a while because they, they are kind of independent media, um, started by the journalists, you know, getting grants, but they, they were very famous for the 2014 coverage. A um, little bit as a Ukrainian, just reading different sources, it was I do agree with what you said, you know, how the media is viewed today and prior to invasion, you know, all this extensive coverage going on in the media of the upcoming conflict. 
was, I guess, too intense for many Ukrainians. I heard from a lot of my friends in Ukraine saying, oh, that's just sensationalism, nothing like that. A lot of distrust. Um, and I guess if what I'm following right now, I can see where the focus is, because when Western media is covering the, the, the war, they definitely look at what you know, is interesting for the American of the Western audience, you know, what are the consequences of specific actions, the, uh, you know, food crisis because of what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. So you can see a lot of that. World War III. <laughs> right. So, sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I guess as a Ukrainian, I usually, I recently started reading the Western media again, just because, you know, I, I prefer to see, to get the news from, from the source, from the ground, like Dr. Merle said. Um, but I guess it helps. It helps just to get a different perspective. Thank you. Again, these are really fascinating responses and they could go on and on. Um, a lot of the questions are asking you to speculate about the future. Um, so I'll, I'll toss you one of those. Um, what do you think will happen next if Russia succeeds in Ukraine? I guess I'll start. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, what I think happens next is Putin has clearly been emboldened by successes that he has had in the past. And if he succeeds in this venture, in his mind, there's not much to stop him from proceeding further. And there are many pressure points that are possible for him to push on harder. Um, the Moldovans are terrified about what's going to happen with Transnistria. Um, the Georgians also have um, two breakaway republics there that are another pressure point that can be pushed on. Um, and, um, you know, Poland is increasingly worried, which is why Poland has been so gracious about taking um, the Ukrainian refugees, because they see themselves as in the line of fire. Um, and then we also have the Baltic states, which are very small. They are extremely difficult to defend because they back against the sea. Um, and I used to do lectures um, at the Special Operations School at Hurlburt when NATO was expanding into the Baltics. And listening to American military officials who were horrified at the prospect of having to defend Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Um, Finland, this is why Finland for the first time is talking about NATO membership, because they've already lost a lot of territory to Russia in the Winter War in um, the 1930s, late 1930s. Um, although, personally, I think the Russians would be really stupid to go after the Finns, but... Um, they were stupid to go after the Ukrainians. Yeah, they were stupid to go after the Ukrainians, too. Um, but they at least have been bitten by the Finns before. <laughs> so, because um, the Finns did in the Winter War what the Ukrainians are doing today. Um, and they are still very, very well trained, very, very well armed, and... Um, you know, that one would not be an easy one. But there are easier pressure points. Transnistria, Georgia, those are easy pressure points. Um, they're not in NATO. They're not in the EU. Um, and so they are outside the circle of protection. Um, so that's what my fear would be. Um, so. Well, again, I'm a historian. I deal with dead people. So, you know, the live ones move around too much. It's uh, hard, to, uh, hard to predict. But um, if, um, and if what, what, a, what a win in Ukraine looks like is also, <laughs> we could speculate about that. Um, so let me speculate what a win would look like first. Um, I think that uh, it would be um, annexing the eastern territories. Um, and I, I don't think it would be taking all of Ukraine. But then again, I didn't think it was going to invade. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a good track record. Again, I'm better with dead people. Um, but, uh, okay, let's say it's that. I, I think um, it would be uh, an emboldened Putin. But I, I don't see him 
uh, going after Poland or the Baltic states. I see him, uh, I think Moldova, yeah, Georgia. I think the, 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 the former Soviet areas uh, and Central Asia, I think we'd see a much more um, uh, uh, sort of potent Russian presence uh, in the, 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 the former Central Asian republics. Uh, and I think uh, we'd also see um, um, uh, more of a, uh, an attempt to, to, to cozy up and secure China uh, as a, uh, um, a, a real ally with, with uh, you know, China presumably uh, you know, patting Putin on the back and saying, yes, yes you are a great power, yes, uh, uh, you know, you know, we, we got a lot more money than you, but yeah, you still have nukes and, and you still count. May I take us from a different perspective from within Ukraine, potentially? Um, the result within Ukraine would be massive partisan warfare across the whole country. Um, essentially what has been to a large degree going on in cities like Mariupol has been partisan style warfare, guerrilla style warfare in uh, urban, um, as well as of course in the West uh, forests. Um, in the long term, um, I see another Afghanistan in that case and um, the ultimate disintegration of the Russian Federation as a state as a result of a long-term loss to partisan warfare in Ukraine. Um, partisan warfare in Ukraine limited to the western part of the country, the far west part of the country, and um, on a vastly smaller scale than what we're going to see today, um, was successful at resisting the Soviets for how many years? Six. At least six years, yeah. yeah. Well into the 50s, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. The only successful partisan resistance um, against the Soviets within the Soviet Union. And again, that there we're talking about a very small group of Ukrainian nationalists fighting in a very limited territorial space. Um, uh, again, at this point, the whole country has become mobilized. Um, so, yes, I. I, I it would be a Pyrrhic victory for Putin uh, because it will, I have no doubt, it will, it will result, result in the, the disintegration of Russia as a state. <clears throat> I've become an optimist. If I can just add briefly. Um, There's something that I listened to a number of conferences um, before the invasion on uh, Harvard Institute, Ukrainian Institute, including, and one of the, there's something one of the speakers said that kind of resonated with me. He said that, you know, Russia understands that war is cheap, but occupation is expensive. So I think what's going on in Kherson may give us a clue on what might happen in, you know, if Russia, Putin prevails. Uh, what they're doing, they're, they're burning, you know, textbooks on history, they're burning Ukrainian textbooks, they um, mm -hmm. make teachers, um, teach in Russian, um, that's one thing. The other thing, they're preparing that referendum that uh, was held in, in the Crimea, that was held in um, the parts of Luhansk and Donetsk regions um, in 2014. Republic. So, Republic. Kherson People's Republic, yes. Uh, and there is resistance to that, and there are protests, which are, of course, extremely dangerous for the people who live them, but I, I think that they would just turn you know, whatever Ukraine that can invade into this sort of republics, they would be just listening to um, Putin and do as he pleases. So. I, I agree. I, I think that that would be, in, in this scenario, that would be the short term or short to medium term result. But I do think the long term result would be a, a, a disaster. Okay. Or Disintegration a, of Russia. A, 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 a success, <laughs> a partisan success. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, in, in this time, I'm, I, I don't know why I'm so confident about it, but I am. <laughs> Well, um, a similar question is our next one, which is, uh, what do you think um, a realistic victory from the Ukrainian perspective would look like? Could you repeat, please? Yeah, um, the next question, and another interesting and, and related question is, what would victory look like oh, for Ukraine? Sorry. Mm -hmm. For the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. I agree here with Robert that we may see a, pro pro um, a long-lasting insurgency taking place in Ukraine, and they can potentially win at the end of it, like the mm -hmm. Afghans win both against the United States and the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, but this will take time, mm -hmm. and, and they'll, they'll inflict serious costs to the Ukrainian economy and the Ukrainian mm -hmm. population at large. And now uh, the West will have a, a role here if they will truly win to try to help rebuild Ukraine 
uh, and continue uh, uh, maintaining it as, as, as part of the Western uh, sphere or, or part of the Western sphere, I guess. That's what I One thing I think will happen if Ukraine, in fact, prevails is that the $300 billion in assets that the West has uh, embargoed uh, will end up being used as reparations to rebuild Ukraine. Russia broke it. Russia can fix it. One difference I would speculate between Afghanistan and Ukraine is that the insurgency in Afghanistan did not succeed in building an Afghan identity. And I think what we're seeing in Ukraine is the building of a Ukrainian identity um, that is shared across the population because they will have this experience, a common experience of response to the Russians working together, achieving objectives. Um, and so in that sense, I think it will be different from Afghanistan because I think Ukraine, oddly enough, <laughs> despite economic damage, despite, you know, horrific losses, will emerge from this, all fingers crossed, um, in a better state, in a better place to move forward than they have been in the past. And I think this started in 2014. Um, I think that's when we really started seeing it, and that that's something that Putin has not understood is that the pressure that he has put on Ukraine, instead of making them weaker, is making them stronger um, in terms of how they think of themselves and their society. I want to go back to the initial question on the success. What if it, he, mm -hmm. he succeed? Well, he has already succeeded in the sense of testing the resiliency and effectiveness of international organizations. Mm -hmm. What he understood very clearly is that it's weak, that states are looking for themselves because of those political movements that have turned inwards, not outward. And I think a, a victory for uh, Ukraine is, is not just dependent on Ukraine itself, but on an understanding mm -hmm. globally through the international mm -hmm. organization that are currently in place as a result of historical movements that have taken place before on are they capable of having mm -hmm. a say and an action in this conflict. And, and, uh, and as a journalist, I would also be cautious about the use of succeed and victory. And uh, that's, I mean, yes, there is a war and potentially there is a winner and a loser, but in a war, everybody loses, and we have mm -hmm. evidence uh, of that today. So the wording, I'm a bit bothered by it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would place the focus on more the international impact mm -hmm. and dependence uh, rather than a state versus another. Thank you. That actually anticipates another question. That, um, can I, can yes, please. Really quickly add one thing. Uh, it's actually, it's a danger is that um, at this point, having gone through what they've gone through, the Ukrainian population is somewhat maximalist. Uh, they will not accept um, a, a ceasefire or, or, or a peace that does not include the return of, of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions and even the Crimea in all likelihood. Um, so there's a great deal of pressure on Zelensky simply from public opinion. I simply just wanted to add that. But in other words, it, it, makes, it makes any kind of um, negotiated peace uh, much more dangerous and much more distant, I would say. Thank you for that also. Um, another question, another really interesting question that we got is, um, do you think the war marks a new, or maybe how do you think the war marks um, a new era in international relations? It was kind of, yeah, <laughs> nice big question. I, I think seconds. that's close to being obvious. Mm -hmm. The answer is yes, from various perspective. We can mm -hmm. look at it. What does it mean about China? And um, mm -hmm. right now, a fairly cautious response by, by China and, and uh, their reaction to, to Russia or their, I would say, even lack of support that we may have anticipated uh, to Russia. So that's, I think, is interesting to pay attention to moving uh, forward. Uh, I would say that from an international organization perspective, 
uh, the incompetency or the weakness of uh, the United Nation in light of what's going on, just because in the manner by which that it's structured. It, I don't think it's intentionally weak. It's just structured in the way that allows Russia to maintain this influence within the organization uh, and therefore uh, disable it or curtail it from acting more forcefully against mm -hmm. an aggressor, that it's very clear that in this case, for me at least, that Russia is the aggressor. Um, from the perspective of the West, and we may be seeing the reinvigoration of Western ideals and liberal democracies, which may not, may not be, the, <laughs> you may be skeptical, uh, but may not be a, a bad result uh, in light of this terrible, uh, terrible war. Uh, but the international order, if you haven't been convinced yet, uh, since 2008, in my mind, has changed already. It's no longer unipolar at the very least is bipolar or multipolar at this, uh, at this point in time. Um, we have multiple actors that consider themselves as great powers, and that's the world that the West needs to accept moving forward and decide how to manage uh, their own interests. I read something, I, I think from Financial Times, but in any event from a, um, a media source, uh, asking whether or not Putin has uh, ended the attraction of populism. Uh, I don't think that's true in the United States, but it may very well be true in Western Europe. We'll see if uh, Marine Le Pen, if Marine Le Pen wins, yeah. all bets are off. Um, another kind of interesting thing is, um, you know, if you go back to the beginning of the UN, um, the General Assembly was very dominant and where the West worked through the General Assembly. But then as the numbers of states grew and we got the Cold War, um, it became very difficult for the West and the United States to work through the General Assembly. And what we're seeing today is because of Russia's position in the Security Council, is we're seeing a shift to the General Assembly um, for resolutions and action. Um, now, the General Assembly cannot enforce action in the same way that the Security Council can, but it is an interesting shift um, to see that movement from the, General, from the Security Council where it was the great powers that determined what happened to moving into the General Assembly where you have much more egalitarian decision making. Um, so that's gonna be something to watch and just kind of see how that plays out because we don't have a choice right now because of Russia's veto power, but to act through the General Assembly where they do not have that. So, you know, and NATO I think has been invigorated in a way that we could not have imagined. <laughs> Especially you're seeing a big shift We'll have to see how real and how prolonged this is, but Germany, there's a shift we're seeing in German foreign policy. Um, you know, like I say, we'll have to see how prolonged and real and deep that is. Um, Sweden and Finland moving away from neutral stances is another very interesting development. Also in Switzerland. Europe. And Switzerland as well. Switzerland got involved in the sanctions. Um, so, there are some fairly profound shifts that are occurring that are gonna be very interesting to follow. There's one other area that nobody ever talks about, but I think may turn out to be significant, and that's energy policy. Uh, it's very clear that to the extent possible over time, because it's not gonna happen immediately, um, Russia is going to become impoverished. 40% uh, of their uh, export revenue comes from petroleum products. Uh, that is going to diminish significantly. Uh, as it diminishes, their influence in the world is going to diminish significantly. Um, but over and above that, I think a lot of people are beginning to value nuclear power more than they did a couple of years ago. Uh, Germany has decided not to shut down uh, the reactor units that are still operating. Uh, France has never had this problem. 80% uh, of all the electricity in France is produced by nuclear power, uh, and they're sitting pretty.
Thank you. I think we have time for at least one more question. Um, a related one, perhaps, is um, how do you think this most recent wave of immigration will affect uh, Western Europe? We talked about, uh, Robert and I, about the potential that right now we see them being welcomed and that's encouraging and even heartwarming, I would say. Um, I'm about to travel with students to the Czech Republic. I'm really excited to see if we're able to engage with some organization that have welcomed, helped, uh, uh, the barely temporarily resettle those uh, refugees. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm the more of the realist in that perspective as well and, and consider that um, if this is going to take time and this is going to be a long-term conflict and Ukrainians will spend more time in Poland or in Czech Republic or Slovakia, we may even see anti-immigration sentiments in those countries towards uh, Ukrainian. As these countries, uh, although fairly stable economically, don't always have an open door to refugees in general mm -hmm. um, into their countries. So I'd be cautious that this wave, this euphoria will uh, continue moving forward if, it's, if we're looking for years of ongoing war. We've seen that just in uh, this past week or this past few weeks in France with the presidential election, Marine Le Pen, who was a, a very strong stance on immigration, has already used the context of a potential wave of immigrants mm -hmm. to France and Western Europe as an argument against Macron, against uh, our opponents. And so I think th the issue here is that the, the media need to stop calling that as immigrants, that is a negative connotation for many people, and contextualize that wave. Because again, the, the, the issue here is that this potential new wave of immigration will fuel populist and anti-nationalist movement and give strength to people like Marine Le Pen and others in, the, in, in some of the Western countries to argue against that type of um, context. And, and so we've seen it in Italy with Syria, we've seen it in Greece, we've seen it in Germany, we, we've seen it in Great Britain, uh, we're seeing it in France. Uh, it's, uh, the, the danger of that is, again, uh, an ethical coverage and usage of the words and contextualizing who those people are and why are they uh, being forced out of the country and, and migrating elsewhere. And then again, understanding that the danger is that it's going to fuel uh, this type of, of political movement. And so I'm quite pessimistic about that new wave, but I'm French, so I'm always pessimistic. <laughs> Um, another thing to think about, though, is um, you know the declining birth rate in Europe, the needs of the workforce. We're seeing that here in the U.S. actually, as we have cut immigration. This is one of the drivers of inflation in our economy today, because we have fewer workers competing for jobs. And um, Europe is in a worse situation than we are in terms of um, population loss. And um, you know, it's interesting because the studies about the previous waves of immigration, we're reading for class this week um, with our graduate students in a class on globalization. We're talking about migration this week. And the previous waves actually helped the German economy. Um, because Germany is very short on workers, and um, you know, this is a way to resolve some of Germany's economic problems, and that's true across much of Europe. Um, and that narrative needs to be explained: you know, the economic impact of immigration, um, you know, how immigrants contribute to economic growth. Um, and, you know, but it's got to be explained. And the data needs to be presented. And, um, you know, that is one way to counter the negative, more negative impacts. But um, that's even happening in the United States. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> recently, the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has uh, come out uh, very strongly in favor of uh, increased immigration to the United States. Now this is a, from their standpoint, a, a two-edged sword because uh, they clearly uh, supported the Trump administration in contracting 
uh, immigration, but uh, many small towns throughout the United States uh, are finding that they need immigrants. And uh, as long as they're not Mexican, I think every, everybody's going to be happy. You know? yeah, I, mean, I, I think we need to go back to, to, to facts, right? Because in the public opinion, that understanding of immigrants is negative regardless of the origin, regardless of the context. And, and, and we have, as scholars, uh, as a member of the media, we have a responsibility to explicate and explain, really, that each context is unique and that there are some impacts, both positive and negative, and multiple layers uh, for, for all of those individuals. They are individuals. They're not a group of immigrants. It's, it's, we're talking about human beings here. And, and I think, uh, yeah, we have a responsibility to, to, to really showcase and, and explicate that, um, to, to, to go against that trend that immigrants is negative. That association, when we test for structural knowledge, to, to go a bit more um, academic here, uh, people in the public opinion immediately match it to negative as a dominant, and uh, that's a problem, right? But that's very helpful for people who want measures against mm -hmm. immigration, because they can rely on the public opinion having that tendency, and, and that's, again, the, the risk here. How much is that a semantic issue? Uh, if we called them refugees, they wouldn't be quite as negatively uh, associated. Well, Legally speaking, we would argue that a refugee is a different status than an immigrant, right? Already it's, a, it's framing the issue differently. So that's the role of a journalist is that to which extent do we associate a refugee and an immigrant and are they the same people? Mm -hmm. and, and the reality is that I'm not a specialist of international law, mm -hmm. but that's, that's already two different situations and we need to explain that because again, the implication in public opinion who are seeking shortcuts or going to sources that are full of disinformation uh, are not going to comprehend necessarily those distinctions that are necessary to, to develop. So those who officially receive the designation of a refugee from the UN comes with responsibility for the host countries. They are supposed to take care of them, uh, to put it simply. Um, so maybe the association is more positive there just because of international law and how it is framed. That being said, it doesn't change the fact that both Western Europe, Central, Europe country, Central European countries, and the United States as well have been very cheap in their welcome of those even deemed to be refugees by international law, especially when they're non-white, non-Christians. Yeah. The, the thrust of my question was not legal, but uh, political. Uh, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, public acceptance. Uh, what, what we know from the studies is that your political beliefs dictate very largely your understanding of that, that association. So uh, if uh, we look, I, I did a study with the Syrian refugees, for instance, and a photo of a child, uh, Ellen Kurdi, for those of you who may remember, washed ashore uh, with a terrible photo. The reaction that people had towards that image and towards the issue of refugee as a whole was very different depending on your political beliefs, uh, particularly on this side of the Atlantic where currently it's very partisan. So, and, and, and again, political actors right now are using those issues for their own deadlines um, because there is constant political cycles, especially short in the US, but other Western countries where they have. And, and so it's a political game more so than uh, understanding to try to educate the public opinion. Thank you all so much. I've been told that the reception is ready. Um, so we can continue the conversation uh, just on the other side of the doors. Um, I'm really, really grateful. I think everyone is grateful. And you've got lots of love from the live stream audience, too. So thank you so very much. <laughs>